Hey guys, welcome back from break. Break. I hope you had a uh, time to relax and focus and figure out um, how you're gonna kind of proceed through the rest of the year since we're not going back, which breaks my freaking heart. Um, but uh, we continue on. So hopefully you read my updates about the AP bio test. If you haven't, go on to that Google Doc and read all my updates. It's gonna it's gonna be a different kind of test. You're only gonna have two FRQs. Um, it's from like when we talked about what the AP questions were um, way long ago. I think we did this in the back of your Ian's. Um, maybe not. In the, oh, here it is. Uh, so when we were talking about all these different questions, so essentially you're going to have number one, um, which isn't really a question mark question anymore. They've kind of fleshed out what each part will be. And I listed that on your updates and you'll have question four on conceptual analysis. Um, it's going to be open book, open note. Um, so essentially I am, they're not going to give you credit for stuff you can look up. So they're not going to be asking you. Like, what is this? Or uh, anything that can really be easily looked up in a book. Um, or if they do ask you that, they're probably going to ask you to expand upon it and describe or explain right or sir. So kind of just be prepared for that. It's going to be really quick. So you're only going to have 25 minutes and then 15 minutes. So make sure that when you sit down to take it, um, I think your guys' test is at 11 a.m. if I'm correct. Um you have to log into AP Central half an hour before your test starts just to, uh, you have to go through a process to prove that you are you. Um, and then I just want to make sure that you guys are like sitting there, you're ready, you're focused to take your test. So make sure you get in there half an hour before our test time. I'll send out reminders and stuff like that. Um, and then you only get 45 minutes. So, uh, make sure that you are ready to take it at that time. All right, we are going to talk about the cell cycle today. Uh, so first, we're actually going to make our new cover page. So we're in our next unit. It is unit five. Uh, it's a relatively short unit. We're going to cover it in a few days. Um, and this is on development. So in our development unit, we're going to be covering how do cells multiply? How do they grow? Essentially leading to uh, the development of multicellular organisms. Uh, and we're going to go through DNA replication and the structure of DNA. Okay, flip the page. So let's talk about the cell cycle. Let's title this the cell cycle. So essentially, all cells in your body go through the cell cycle. And what the cell cycle is, is it's the cycle that cells go through to divide. And so pretty much every cell in your body is somewhere in the cell cycle, except for cells that do not divide. So there is uh, neurons, muscle cells, those types of cells, because they don't divide, they are in the cell cycle, they're just in a special phase of the cell cycle, and they'll just always be there. So the cell cycle is how we prepare and have cells divide. Okay. So if we're talking about any somatic cells, it's going to be... Um, the mitosis. So somatic cells are all your body cells, all the cells that make up uh, you as a person. So like skin cells, hair cells, fat cells, muscle cells, all of those will go through mitosis. If it is your gametes, so your sex cells, so if you uh, were born a woman, it's eggs. If you're born male, it's sperm. Those specific cells will go through meiosis because they're making more gametes and it's a different process, which we'll go over later in the week. So for now, we're going to focus on mitosis. So the cell cycle, like the word cycle, is a cycle. So the uh, start is the end. So you're going to draw a circle. We're going to draw it kind of small, just because we're going to write a lot of stuff outside of it. 
and the cell cycle consists of four steps and the size of the wedge is going to uh, uh, correlate with the amount of time that the cell spends in those phases. So we have about a quarter of the time um, pieced out between two different phases and then one phase goes really, really fast and then we kind of have another phase like so. Oh, it's like a sideways peace sign. Okay, so when we look at our different phases and you can you it's a cycle, right? So like there are things that have to come before other things, uh, but cells can jump into the cell cycle uh, at a couple specific points. So the first stage right here, the longest wedge is called G1. G stands for gap. So this is the gap one phase. And what happens during gap one um, is I think of the G standing for growth. So the cell is going to grow in size. So we're gonna have cell growth. We're also gonna start replicating our organelles because if at the end of this cycle, our cell's gonna divide, we have to make sure the two cells that descend from this original cell all have the organelles that they need. So we're gonna have organelle replication. And most of them are membrane bound. So essentially you just need to make more phospholipids. Um, things like nutrients will need to be present, growth factors, stuff like that. But these are kind of like the two main things that will occur. The next phase is called the S phase. And the S stands for synthesis. And the specific synthesis that it is occurring is DNA synthesis. So this is the stage when DNA replication is occurring. Once again, if we're starting with one cell and we're gonna have it split, we're gonna end up with two daughter cells. So we call these two the daughter cells is our parent cell. So these are our daughter cells. This is our parent cell. All right, so when that parent cell divides, it no longer exists anymore, but all of its matter, all of its cell parts are now located in its two daughter cells. This parent cell, so like in humans, we all have 46 chromosomes we'll start with 46 chromosomes. Like, let's say this is a fat cell. So this fat cell has 46 chromosomes. When it divides and creates two fat cells from itself, each of these fat cells will also have 46 chromosomes. They will be full human cells. The reason that that happens is, is because during the S phase, you replicate your DNA, so you double it. So for a moment, we have 92 chromosomes, and then that big giant cell with 92 chromosomes splits into two smaller cells that have 46. The next phase is called G2. The G stands for the same thing, so it's gap two. And the same things will occur. The cell will grow more, the cell will finish replicating its organelles. The last phase is called the M phase. And the M stands for the mitotic phase. The mitotic phase is the fastest phase. Once a cell enters, it will quickly kind of run through mitosis. I think it takes 24 hours. Um, and then the cell will have divided. So the mitotic phase is when cell division occurs. I'm gonna put the dividing symbol because I'm running out of room. So cell division will occur here. There's multiple stages, so there's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis, but we will go over that in a different video. Okay, so kind of looking at the structure of our cell cycle, there is one other stage, and the stage is called G0, and it's not found within the active cell cycle. So if a cell is within this cycle, it is actively dividing. So if we have something like a neuron where it doesn't actively divide, 
the neuron will not be found in any of these stages. The neuron will be found in a special, special menu, stage called G0 or G0. And that's found outside of the cell cycle. Okay, so we call it G0 or G0. Um, it's when a cell exits the cell cycle, so it's not actively dividing, and we call it the resting phase. I'll just grab my pen that doesn't have any ink. It's dying. This is where cells go when they're not actively dividing, or this is where cells go if they didn't divide properly, they didn't grow properly, they didn't replicate their DNA properly. So if there was any mistake or error that was caught during the cell cycle, cells will be sent to G0. So they won't divide, which is good, because then you can lead to cancers, right? So if this cell cycle is dividing cells, if I have a cell that is uncontrollably dividing, so it's constantly going through the cell cycle, that's what causes tumors. A tumor is just an overgrowth of cells. So if someone has a skin cancer, it's an overgrowth of skin cells. If someone has bone cancer, it's an overgrowth of bone cells. So the reason that tumors start is because some cell mutated in such a way that it goes through this cell cycle uncontrollably. So hopefully your body can catch that and send that uh, cell to G0 and then like killer T cells can come over and take care of that cell. But a lot of times they don't get caught and so that's how people start to get tumors and cancers. All right, so that's G0. Let's kind of pull one more label. So we kind of refer to all of these stages that are not division as interphase. So we're gonna kind of highlight our little circle. So from the end of M to the beginning of M, all of this, okay, so we'll put a little from here to here, that is known as interphase. The cell's not dividing. Um, it's growing, it's getting larger, but it's not actively dividing. So interphase is where most cells are. Most cells are somewhere in here and then very quickly they'll divide and then all their descendants, their daughter cells kind of go right back into um, interphase. Okay, there are things we call checkpoints all throughout this cell cycle. Once again, your body wants to regulate everything. So if a cell is not prepared to go into S phase, meaning it didn't grow enough, it didn't replicate any of its organelles. We don't want it to continue on because then you're gonna end up with these cells that are really, really small in size and they'll probably be lacking some organelles. So it would be hard for them to grow in size, right? So if I split and I make a really tiny cell that has no smooth ER, how can I make more lipids to grow larger? right? So that would just be a non-functional cell. So there are these checkpoints along the way. There's four that we're going to talk about that ensure that the cells are appropriate and ready to divide. So there is a checkpoint going from G1 to S phase. I'm just going to draw them as like large hash marks. Hash marks. Cool. This is called the G1 checkpoint. I'm just going to put little checks for checkpoint. And at the G1 checkpoint, what's being checked for, let's make a little list, is uh, the cell size. So is the cell large enough? The next thing that we're gonna check for is, are there enough nutrients available so that we can sustain cell division? So we need enough of our macromolecules, glucose, ATP, et cetera. Are there growth factors, enough growth factors present? Because we're gonna have to continue growing so you need the presence of growth factors, which are hormones, in order to ensure that the cell continues to grow. And then is there any DNA damage? So you're gonna kind of see we check for DNA damage often because those are mutations. If we have a damage to the DNA, you could create more cells that have this damage um, and then that can start leading to disorders and stuff like that. There is another checkpoint in the S phase, kind of going into G2. So you can kind of see we have these checkpoints 
where we're kind of about to go into the next phase. Because a cell, if it does not pass a checkpoint, it goes into G0. So if we pass this checkpoint, the cell kind of continues through. If the cell does not pass this checkpoint, it'll exit the cell cycle and go to G0 and just be a resting cell and it might uh, be programmed to kill itself. This is called the S phase checkpoint. S phase check. And essentially we're just checking that DNA replication occurred appropriately. So it'll check that there are uh, 92 chromosomes. It'll check that they're paired up appropriately. Um, it'll check for uh, if there were any errors during DNA replication, and it'll correct those. The next checkpoint occurs here. Once again, G2 to M. It's called the G2 checkpoint. And you're essentially checking for the same things as in G1, but so we're gonna check, because now we are actively gonna divide, the cell does need to be a particular size. So it needs to be large enough that when it splits, um, it can be two new cells that can, they'll grow a little, cause they'll be a bit small, uh, but they'll kind of grow a little to get to the appropriate size. And now we're once again gonna check for DNA damage. Because right, if the DNA is damaged, we want to send that cell to G0 so that the cell can be um, programmed to kill itself. And then lastly, there is a little checkpoint during the M phase. And it's called the spindle assembly checkpoint. There are multiple checkpoints during the M phase. This is just one uh, example, and kind of one important one. But during mitosis, the cell will kind of start as a cell, and then it'll line up its chromosomes down the center, and then essentially those get pulled apart, and the cells divide. So the spindle assembly, uh, the spindles are the proteins that pull the chromosomes apart. So if I want to make sure that 46 unique chromosomes get into each cell, I need to make sure every chromosome has a little protein spindle. They're like bungee cords attached so that I evenly divide my DNA. So we're checking that the chromosomes are attached to the spindles at this point. If a chromosome is not attached to a spindle, um, the cell will either get sent to G0 or it'll just wait until the spindle attaches. And then once all the spindles are attached, it'll then move through the rest of the M phase. Okay, so those are our checkpoints. Now to get through a checkpoint, the way that these cells kind of know that we're through a checkpoint or ready is there is a production of certain proteins. So we're gonna kind of be down here on the bottom. So we're gonna be working with two different proteins. The first protein, and let's just draw it shaped like this, little nub, cute. Uh, these proteins are known as cyclins. There are multiple types of cyclins. We're just gonna talk about the function of cyclin in general, but for each checkpoint, they will use a different cyclin. And I'll show you a diagram of that later. So cyclins are proteins. They're created by the cell that is actively in the cell cycle. The next protein we're going to talk about, let's do what color? K color. I choose you. Make it match so it's gonna have a little inward nubbin. Okay. And these are known as C, D, Ks. C, D, K stands for cyclin dependent. Ooh, kinases. Now, 
if you remember from when we did the G protein and all the protein kinases, all kinases are enzymes, remember, see we have ACE here, they're enzymes that phosphorylate other molecules. So this is an enzyme that phosphorylates some other molecules, okay? If you remember when you add or remove anything from an enzyme, sorry, a protein, that protein changes shape. So if you remember this phosphorylating is activating other enzymes. So this protein kinase is going to phosphorylate, which essentially activates other enzymes. So in this case, we're activating other enzymes. So that's the function of our CDK. You can see in the name it says it's dependent on the cyclin. So that means this enzyme can only be activated in the presence of a cyclin. So these two need to bind. So we're gonna have binding here. The active site will match uh, the shape of the substrate. Okay, um, so let's add a couple notes. So CDKs are activated by cyclin. And they also, and this seems counterintuitive, uh, they also catalyze the breakdown of cyclin. So the CDK does a few things, okay? So it will, um, in the presence of cyclin, so it'll be activated, it will phosphorylate other enzymes when it's active, but then it will also catalyze the breakdown of cyclin. And I'll show you what that means. So we're gonna just do one example. So we're gonna pick just one checkpoint. Um, and I'm going to choose this one. So we're gonna talk about how does a cell get through the G2 checkpoint. So let's make a couple notes on here. So throughout the cell cycle, the amount of cyclin, so this protein, changes. It'll kind of increase over time, and then once it hits its checkpoint, it drops off. It'll increase again, and it'll drop off. CDKs, because they're enzymes, they're reusable, so they pretty much stay the same amount through the entire cell cycle. So I kind of want to show you what that looks like without screwing up my thing. I'll show you later. Okay, so essentially, after a cell has moved through the checkpoint and then kind of has moved through the next phase, the amount of cyclin for that checkpoint is really, really, really low, okay? So let's draw this with my green color. So let's just, we're gonna focus here on this checkpoint. I'll put a little star, cause that's where we're focusing. So at the end of the M phase, our amount of cyclin is really, really low. There's our cyclin concentration is low. Our cyclin for this checkpoint. This checkpoint has a different cyclin. This checkpoint has a different cyclin. This one has a different cyclin. It's called like cyclin A, cyclin E, cyclin D. So this particular one, its cyclin concentration will be really low after the cell exits the M phase. As the cell goes through interphase, so as we kind of go through, we're constantly producing cyclin. So the cell's going through protein synthesis and it's now producing more and more of this cyclin. So kind of as it goes through interphase, by the time it approaches its checkpoint, we now have a high concentration of cyclin. So for this example, the cell spends interphase creating cyclin. So we're having uh, protein synthesis so that by the time we get to our next checkpoint again, we'll have an increased amount of that cyclin. When this cyclin has reached a certain concentration, I'm gonna kind of draw this up in here. Let's make an arrow. Cyclins bind to CDKs. So if I have a low amount of cyclin, I have fewer cyclins binding. 
If I have a really high concentration of cyclin, I have more cyclin binding, I have more active enzyme. So once we get to this point where you have a lot of cyclins, you're gonna have a really high concentration of these complexes where the cyclin is bound to the CDK, like so. So this is called a cyclin CDK complex. Okay, so these two are bonded. So here we had low cyclin. The reason we had low cyclin is because they were all degraded by these CDKs, okay? So by the time we got out of M, all these cyclins were broken down by these enzymes. So we had low cyclin. As the cell starts producing more cyclin, more cyclins are binding to CDKs, and then you're gonna get a high enough concentration that can move you past this checkpoint, but then all those cyclins get degraded pretty quickly. Once this cyclin is bound to this CDK, our CDK is active now. So now we have an active enzyme and it's going to phosphorylate or activate other enzymes. So if this cell is trying to move from G2 to the M phase, if the cell was healthy enough and it replicated its DNA appropriately and it grew enough and it had all the appropriate organelles for protein synthesis, then you're gonna have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of these complexes. And what this CDK will activate is it'll activate the target enzymes to continue to the next phase. So like the first phase of mitosis is called prophase. You need to dissolve the nuclear envelope. Um, and so there's enzymes that will do that. The enzymes don't just do it, they need to be activated. So this CDK will phosphorylate these target enzymes that will cause the next phase to happen. That's why our checkpoints are near the end of our phase because they cause the movement into our next phase, okay? So this active enzyme is going to phosphorylate target enzymes to continue to the next phase. Okay, so for this checkpoint, it'll be like those enzymes that will degrade the nuclear envelope, or it'll be uh, the enzymes that cause the spindles to be created because you only have these spindles during mitosis. If we're trying to get through a different checkpoint, we're gonna be activating different enzymes, right? So going from G1 to S, this CDK needs to activate all the enzymes for DNA replication. So you need to activate all your helicases and your isomerases and your topoisomerases, and you'll know what all those things are in a few days. So different enzymes will get activated at each checkpoint, and those enzymes are the enzymes meant to carry the cell through that checkpoint or through that phase. So we have all these active CDKs. They're gonna move our cell into M, but what happens is because these CDKs activated by cyclin, they also catalyze the breakdown of cyclin, the cell's gonna have a really high concentration of these complexes, but then we're gonna have the breakdown of cyclin. Once cyclin is broken down, it'll be released as products, and then we have inactive CDKs again. So we're gonna get through this checkpoint, but then during M phase, all our cyclins are broken down, and then we have that low concentration again. The cell will kind of build it back up. They'll bind to CDKs. It'll help move us through this checkpoint again. Cool. Okay, I wanted to show you some things on my computer. Okay, don't mess this up. I messed it up. Okay. <laughs> so I want to show you this first. Ooh, so zoomed in. Zoom out. So you can see we have our different phases. It's so cute here in colors. Um, okay, craziness, right? So we just talked about 
this complex from this arrow kind of to here, right? Getting from G2 to M. So we were kind of focusing on this complex right here. So we were talking about CDK2, cyclin A2. And so the cyclin will activate this CDK. And then this CDK will activate other enzymes. And then you have CDK1 and cyclin B1, and these different cyclins and different CDK combos are what help move the cell from one phase to the next phase. Oh wait, sorry, we were actually doing this one. Um, so this is the amount we need to create a lot of cyclin B1, and those will bind to CDK1s, and then they'll kind of jump into the M phase. So you can understand like each of these CDKs will have a different shape active site because each of these cyclins will be a slightly different shape. So only B1 can bind to one, only D1 or D3 can bind to four or six, so on and so forth. And then you also have all these things that can inhibit, uh, remember when we said when there's an arrow with a line, they'll inhibit these uh, enzymes. And so these are different factors that your body would release to stop a cell from dividing even if it's healthy and passing checkpoints, it'll just stop the division so that you don't have constant overgrowth of cells. Next thing, okay, so this is kind of just showing how the CDK, where is my cursor? I see her, I see her. Uh, the CDK will activate target proteins. So here you have your CDK, here's your cyclin. When the cyclin binds to the CDK, your CDK is now active. Okay, and then remember kinase is all phosphorylate things. So it's grabbed a phosphate group from an ATP and then it's going to bind to this target protein. So this might be a protein involved in mitosis or a protein involved in DNA synthesis and it'll phosphorylate that enzyme and then that will now be an active enzyme. So this is an enzyme that'll help us uh, move through the next stage and then cyclin will be degraded. If cyclin's degraded before this enzyme activates any other enzymes, that's just how it is. Um, if you have a high concentration of cyclin, hopefully another cyclin will come right in and bind and then activate. It's kind of like whenever there's moments when CDK has a cyclin bind, it'll just activate these target enzymes. And then this is the last thing I wanted to show you. So you can kind of see um, our different cycle. Where is my cursor? My different cyclins. So we have all of our different checkpoints here. And you can kind of see that it will have an increase in that concentration kind of right up till we get to the beginning of that phase. So we have our highest concentration at that phase. And then those cyclins will get degraded immediately. And that concentration will drop off our CDK amount will kind of stay the same through the whole thing because they're enzymes, so they are reusable. Okay, that's essentially all I have for you today. Um, so we're still kind of figuring out the grading thing. Sat through a like freaking three and a half hour board meeting last night. So Essentially, grading-wise, we uh, the board voted to have Model 4, which wasn't even a proposed model. How exciting. And Model 4 is going to let you, as an individual child, choose whether you would like to receive a letter grade or a credit, no credit. So the letter grade barriers are going to be a little stretched out. So instead of like a traditional 90 to 100 is an A, it'll be something like 85 to 100 is an A, and then kind of all of our scales are gonna get dropped off. I don't know what the scales are yet, I just know that we're gonna widen the barrier for each grade. Um, if you choose the credit, no credit, we'll choose a particular threshold, so you must get this percentage in the class, and that's a pass, or if you don't, it's a no credit. So credit, no credit doesn't get calculated into your GPA. You just get units. So you get your credits, but it's like uh, people do it in college a lot when they just need the units, but they don't need the grade for it. So I never did that in college, but I know a lot of my colleagues did it for classes like their history classes. Like if you're a science major, but you need to take a history and it's maybe not your strength, you would take that class as credit, no credit. It's just simply because you need the credits, but your grade in the class didn't. Uh, help you proceed into like a next history class because you didn't need to take a next history class. So you get to choose for each class, all four of your classes, what method you want to go with. 
Um, on Friday, we have some PLT meetings. Uh, so like science department will meet, etc. And we're probably going to get that figured out and flesh out like what the grade barriers are and stuff like that. Um, so I will let you know when that comes out. There's most likely going to be a deadline for you to decide. Um, so you'll have to figure out, do I want to get the grade or do I want to go with credit, no credit by a certain point? Um, and that will be communicated with you as well. Um, I like this decision. I think it is the best for the most people. Um, and that's what kind of, I always look for what causes the biggest, best outcome for the most people and the least amount of suffering. So I don't want you to think that you need to choose the grade just because it's a grade. Um, if you're a senior and you just need units, um, you can choose to just take it for units. If you want the grade on your transcript, calculate it into your GPA, go forward and choose that one. I urge you to choose the model that would ease your stress the most. I feel like there's so much you're already dealing with. Um, and I feel like choosing an option that you don't necessarily want, but maybe other people might want for you. You kind of got to be a little selfish and do what's best for you. So I will communicate with you once we figure out kind of those like percentage thresholds and then I'll figure out deadlines. And then there's going to be some way that you communicate with me which method you want for this class. Um, so depending on what you choose, um, there's stuff I'll be grading for you and there's stuff I won't be grading for you. So if you choose the credit, no credit, um, I'll kind of be grading things a little less strict. Um, if you are going to do the letter grade, then I'll be grading everything for you. Not more strict. I'll just be grading everything for you. Um, credit, no credit. I necessarily won't grade like your formatives, um, and stuff like that. Okay. I'll get everything figured out, uh, probably after Friday. All right. I will see you guys later. Bye.